Hi, everyone. My name is Marissa Evangelista. I'm an MFA intern, and I will be your co-host here for tonight's We'll Talk with Artists. Our digital discussion tonight is with three-dimensional artist Davide Prete. Davide is an architect, a sculptor, and a professor of fine arts. He believes that there are strong connections between sculptures and their environment in the public. He finds that they can heavily impact the city as they can assist with representing the city's identity, culture, and the surrounding aesthetics. In his creative process, Davide enjoys exploring different materials, revealing the beauty of the piece's technicality and mathematics required. Additionally, I would like to introduce the host of our show, Will Scott. Will is an art historian with an extensive career as a photographer and the former head of adult programs in the National Gallery of Art. He is uniquely qualified to bridge the gap between artists and the public. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, thank you, Davide, for agreeing to be interviewed this uh, this evening, and thanks to all of our viewers and listeners uh, and those that might enjoy it later when it goes on YouTube. Uh, so, uh, Davide, uh, you are a fairly recent uh, naturalized American citizen, and you grew up and had your early training in Venice, correct? Or uh, Around. Yes. Yes. So I was born in northern Italy, precisely in Treviso, near Venice. Probably you know Treviso indirectly for the famous Prosecco. Yes. <laughs> for the oh, Prosecco yes. wine, the tiramisu cake. <laughs> but also, you know, there were uh, uh, several artists uh, were born there. Bruno, uh, Arturo Martini, Paris Bordeaux, Gino Rossi, uh, Antonio Canova. So there are the, there, there is uh, in Treviso a really good artistic scene. But my, my first access to art and making was actually through my father, uh, that is an artist blacksmith. He collaborated with this uh, great artist, um, uh, his name is Tony Benetton. Uh, Tony was making these huge sculptures in, in steel. And so my first, uh, my initial connection with art uh, and sculpture uh, was through, through them. And after, I mean, I, I went to the Art Institute and after I studied architecture in, in Venice at the UF, I passed the national exam. I started working as architect, uh, but at the same time, I was always making sculptures and, you know, doing national, international shows. And so I... I I ended up in United States, uh, uh, not uh, for love, uh, and uh, not not directly from for art, because I I met actually my wife uh, in uh, in Africa, and uh, she was there for for a for a school tour, and I was a really good kayaker at the time, so I was doing whitewater kayaking kayaking in the in Zambezi River, and uh, so I met my wife there. She's American and uh, italian american and so after years uh, that is spent in italy we moved we moved here in uh, 2006 2007 i think yeah oh, well i'm glad you <laughs> made your way uh, uh to america uh, and to our area your sculpture is very fascinating and and quite diverse but as a trained art historian with 30 years at the National Gallery, you know the wonderful collection of Italian art, international art influenced by the Italians. So I have to ask one or two questions about that. Uh, okay. The first being, are there any of the, the great iconic uh, Italian artists in any medium that have had an impact on you uh, and your development as an artist? Well, in, initially, Arturo Martini, uh, was uh, one of my first uh, uh, passions, and uh, I really loved the the artwork, the sculptures that he was making. But during my career, I met, uh, especially at the beginning, I met so many artists. Uh, I was really lucky because uh, my father was actually introduced me this um, international scene uh, through uh, international shows, and so. Even when I was uh, 17, 18, uh, at that time, I had, I was lucky, I, I met uh, artists, blacksmith, uh, like Alfred Aberman, Uri Offi, Joseph Mook, uh, Tom Joyce, uh, and also designer like Bruno Munari, for example, uh, Albert Paley. So I had, uh, I was really lucky because even when I was really young, I met all these uh, sculptors and painters and designer 
And it was actually a natural uh, transition to, uh, um, to move from really small things because at the beginning I studied jewelry and metals meeting at the Institute of Art. And after I studied architecture, so really large sculptures <laughs> and uh, large, large projects. And so it was natural to also study, uh, you know, medium sized sculptures and, uh, about, you know, uh, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's there there's a connectedness, of course, between yeah. all of the arts, uh, and uh, it seems as though you, uh, with your own hand and head, have worked through some of those connections between the smaller, so-called minor arts and uh, large scale sculpture. But I have a couple. Why, uh, Rissa, put up the first uh, image just so we have a little uh, reference point. But I do want to ask a couple follow up questions about Italian art. Uh, and um, uh, international art as well. So when I think of Venice uh, as an American, as a historian of American art, I think of people like Titian, uh, Giorgione, and people mm -hmm. like that. Uh, <laughs> sure. and, and you didn't mention any of them, and that's understandable, especially from the way you uh, spoke about your early uh, experiences in art. But now while we have this image on the screen, uh, mm -hmm. and you mentioned your father introducing you to international contemporary art, I mm -hmm. think you were referring to, I, uh, are you influenced by or familiar with or impressed by American large scale sculptors like Richard Serra? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Frank Stella. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. So. What I'm getting at here is that, in a way, you are really international in your origins uh, as an artist. Uh, and and to, to sort of dwell too much on your Italian heritage in art, perhaps, is, is a, a little misleading. <laughs> uh, I think that yeah, I think that in Italy we have this uh, stratif the historical stratification that we perceive is so natural. You know, even uh, from an architectural point of view, when you walk on the street, you have you know you can see medieval yes. buildings, you have Renaissance building, you have you know Baroque. Uh, so it is so natural to see the historical stratification and uh, being in contact with all these artists. That is something that I you know that that I see like a natural connection. Yes. And yes. in public art, I think that is uh, in Italy is actually more difficult to uh, make public art. Um, First, uh, for uh, because we don't have a lot of space, yeah. <laughs> everything is. Uh, You've is, already uh, got really great different. public art, <laughs> <laughs> and so here, actually, actually, in the United States, uh, it's much better because you know there are always uh, new projects and new constructions, but also from an um, economical point of view, they have these great programs where they give a percentage of the you know building cost to to art, and so yes. in Italy, actually, for public art. Uh, I can see uh, United States that is more is more natural to to uh, to work. I feel like that is more natural working here than than in Italy. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I may see public art uh, is always a sort of imposition that the artist and the architect uh, does uh, to the public. Uh, so it's not like you know when you are making a small sculpture that is. Uh, sort of personal connection you have a personal yeah. connection to yeah. it and in public art uh, i believe that the artist should feel responsible to connect uh, uh, with the with the place you know to the people that live and use the space and so when you create and install a public sculpture uh, you set you know a new focal point for for the public that change uh, we always uh, hope in a, a positive way you change the perception of the space, uh, you change the habits, uh, you know, the everyday life. And it's not always easy to connect with the space. Uh, you you mentioned before Richard Serra, if you remember, you know, the tilted arc uh, when the yeah. um, government, you know, in New York, uh, uh, first uh, commission, they, they pay the work uh, and, and, and after <laughs> they, they destroyed. 
uh, that was actually a perfect is actually a perfect example uh, of a conversation. You know, not only about materiality and. Well, Davide, I think the way that you're expressing yourself is very refreshing, uh, and very humanistic. Uh, in mm -hmm. the sense that you are aware of the impact that you're having on the surroundings of your art and uh, other people's interactions with it. And you just cited one of the prime examples that I think most of uh, our listeners and viewers are aware of. The idea that the artist somehow has the license to sort of push everyone's face into what they see as art. And I'm, I, and I'm not judging that one way or the other. I'm just saying that I think you have a very humanistic way of thinking about mm. that. And I have one last sort of preparatory question before we look closely at these works that you've selected to share with us. And that is, in the 20th and 21st century, architecture is often very sculptural in its form and practice. So what is it that persuaded you to make the transition? You're already a practicing architect. That's a risky enough profession. And then you become an artist, which is usually even more economically risky. So what made the transition? Yeah, two reasons. One was uh, that I realized after you know, five or six years of uh, working as architect, uh, I realized that the creativity involved in the project uh, was uh, minimal. <laughs> So maybe 10, 15, 20% of the work uh, uh, was uh, a creative work. The rest of it uh, was uh, bureaucracy, permitting process, uh, dealing with engineering part of it, uh, dealing with the client. Uh, and so, yeah. yes. I mean, it was fun to work in big projects. One of the uh, latest projects that I did uh, in Italy for uh, Tony Follina Architects uh, was uh, I work on this big winery, we work on, on a 42 million euro project, uh, renovation project. So uh, I, I work on pretty big projects. Uh, but um, when I moved to United States, I had the opportunity to start uh, from scratch. And I actually um, was going to, to do a master uh, in architecture, but I met this professor at the university and uh, that knew some of the artists that I knew back in Italy. Hmm. And he convinced me to, to go there and do a, my MFA. I had, uh, you know, it was a, uh, a feeling that I had uh, uh, at the beginning that wasn't my, uh, my way. And yeah. even when I started architecture, I was more interested in the artistic part. I wanted to work uh, yes. understanding better way uh, how to manage big spaces. But my idea was always to work more in with with sculptural uh well i want to i want to uh personally um say to you that i think you made a very wise decision it, one of my other activities is as a citizen planner uh in mm -hmm. annapolis and i was on the planning commission for 30 years so you would have had to deal with people like me <laughs> or people with less <laughs> knowledge of <laughs> art and architecture than me being able to change your designs <laughs> it's so, not always <laughs> even in public art uh, it's not always easy to yeah, so we there are, there are i mean uh, probably the public uh, don't know that but when you start with a concept uh, in public art normally they see there is um, an, an evaluation process uh, and i think in my experience sculptors uh, and painters and muralists uh, get more uh, respect and less interference than architects. Uh, but that's another conversation you and I can So, have. So, Will, I'm going to interject here. I've known Davide for a long time, and I've seen his dad's work in Treviso um, and, 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 and circumvent this whole entire public paid piece of his artwork versus his private piece. And I have to tell you, he has navigated this field incredibly in Washington, DC, because he's done the big works. He's, he's, he's not in any way, I would say, scaled down what he wanted to do. 
at mm -hmm. the same time, he produced what he thought was just the right thing for the project. And he and I worked together for, oh, I don't know, Davide, maybe it's been 15 years, 20 years, I don't remember. <laughs> but at the same time, um, he's navigated this beautiful field of, of, of producing public private art at his own, without compromising his integrity. And that's a very difficult thing to do, especially it in is, it is very, so. It is very difficult. And I thank you for uh, adding that because that's exactly what I was trying to get at uh, from a more distant uh, perspective. Uh, in America, I think that despite all the controversy over many objects, many pieces of public art, uh, by and large, people have more respect for the quote unquote artists, like someone like Davide, than they do an architect. And, and I could go into a long discussion that would bore all of you uh, <laughs> about, about why I think that's so. But now we have the opportunity to look uh, at his individual work. So thank you for sharing that. And uh, Davide, would you uh, tell us a little bit about this particular piece? And, and you can sort of take it from the point of view that we've just been discussing, you know, the environment and, and what you were trying to communicate to the people that would encounter this piece. Yeah, so we were talking about, you know, bureaucracy and uh, all the limitations that we receive from uh, the selection process. But we always, as artists, uh, the idea that we are free in our creative process uh, is actually not completely true, right? Because uh, even when, when we are making art, uh, we have uh, uh, always external impositions, we have limits, uh, limitations that um, we have to deal with. And if we don't have them, I mean, normally we create them, right? We decide to use a certain kind of materials, we decide to use... Uh, specific um, dimensions or specific specific shapes uh, in in my in my work uh, i always try to limit my freedom because it will be impossible to to work without it and so even this sculpture icarus uh, is actually the the idea was to represent uh, uh, with these two big wings uh, in Ford steel and in stainless steel uh, not only the meat of Daedalus and Icarus uh, but is a sort of representation of our limitations as humans so the the Ford uh, black steel uh, represents uh, represents our our limits and uh, and the stainless steel the shiny rounded shapes in stainless steel uh, that are actually the wings are everything that we create uh, in terms of technology in order to overcome our limits. And so, if you remember, you know the 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 myth the myth of uh, Icarus and Daedalus. I mean, uh, Icarus uh, Daedalus uh, explained how to build these uh, wings with uh, wax and feathers, uh, but um, Icarus went too close uh, to the sun. And uh, his wings melted and, and fell, right? Yes. So I think that we have always to think about uh, technology. We have always to think about this myth. We, we cannot go too far. We, we, we cannot go too close to the sun uh, because we could fall, right? And so uh, the general idea for the sculpture was uh, was this, to create this representation. And, you know, it's, uh, it's also uh, in terms of uh, materials and shapes. Uh, I always like to work with contrast. And so uh, it was really interesting to work with these uh, pipes in stainless steel to bend them and shape them and uh, forge these uh, big uh, uh, arms, you know, in uh, in steel. So but when you speak shape. of your materials uh, and uh, the, the way that you think, thought about this piece, I am struck, I think, as everyone must be because of the uh, perspective of the uh, photograph by the tremendous dynamic uplift, but you were speaking about materials. Did you deliberately intend that the wing-like stainless steel elements would represent the, the, the brightness, the intensity of the sun, and then the dark uh, steel would represent the damage that came to Icarus's 
wings for flying too close. Was that part of your intention? In yeah, more areas? more uh, the the representation of the limits that we have, uh, the use of the technology. So the stainless steel, you know, shiny stainless steel was a sort of symbol for the technology that we use. Uh, and so the idea that we can, we always, you know, build a different kind of wings, right? To overcome yes. our limits. We have cars, so we, we have the phone, we have computers. I'm thinking, you know, right now about um, all the new techs uh, that we are uh, creating, you know, chat GPT, we, we have uh, all these AI, new AI systems yeah. and we have, so there are, you know, some issues related to them, right? So if we develop them too much, we could have, uh, we could encounter some, some, some issues that, uh, and so, I mean, that, that was the main idea for this culture. It's a very beautiful sculpture. Where is it cited? So actually, this one was uh, it was normally uh, on on public sculptures. It's interesting because there are uh, different uh, programs, right? But for this sculpture, I receive uh, a grant uh, uh, in order to work uh, at uh, Illinois University, Southern Illinois University, build the sculptures and leave it there for a couple of years. Uh -huh. And uh, so they paid, you know, for 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 the materials, the work, and everything. And I practically had this contract that they they were keeping the sculpture uh, there for two years. So I was able to move the sculptures in different locations. Oh. And so and uh, and now is actually uh, near my studio. And it's interesting because um, some of the uh, public art that I'm making are true commissions programs and uh, like with the DC Commission of Art and Humanities. Uh, but some of them are actually cultures that are not related directly to, uh, or at least initially they are related to the space, but uh, they can be moved and they can find a new a new, a new, new space. Well, so that's a, that's a fascinating, I did not know that that was a way that uh, a sculptor might work. Uh, uh, thinking of the vast expense that uh, any large scale uh, sculpture uh, entails for materials and moving, am I clear in understanding that you now personally own this piece mm -hmm. and could have it moved at your expense or someone's mm -hmm. expense wherever you would like to display it? Yes, yes. Yes, there are uh, a lot of uh, counties and cities they don't want to invest a uh, um, large amount of money to, yes. to have a permanent sculpture. So they created these um, uh, rentals, rental programs practically. And yeah. artists, sculptors uh, uh, can, can actually give the sculpture for a year, two years, you know, they have these contracts. And so they, they it's actually interesting because they can, yeah. Uh, change and you know I, I didn't realize sculptures. that that was something that municipalities were doing but uh, I mentioned that pro possible project uh, to you before we uh, went live and so I'm going to keep that in mind uh, <laughs> Fantastic. as a strategy uh, well uh, you've got lots of uh, great things that we want to look at so Marissa could we see the next slide this uh, David if I, because of the time uh, this sort of tells its own story but would you quickly sort of tell us how the uh, project came about? Was it that uh, process you just described for the previous one with public sculpture and it, what this one is? Uh, is it really just steel painted white with what letters, what text? Yeah, yeah. So this one is a permanent sculpture. So uh, it's for the DC a commission from uh, for Capitol View Library in DC. And so the sculpture was specifically designed for the library. And uh, normally for this project and other projects, I always try to find the connection with the space, uh, you know, what the Romans uh, called the genius logi, the, the, the spirit of the place, right? Yes. And so for this specific uh, project, uh, I had the idea to represent uh, the freedoms that come from reading and studying with two open pages of the book uh, that represents also two wings, you know, to give the, yes. the idea of freedom uh, from that, that come from reading. And, uh, and this one was uh, a project that was sponsored by the Commission of Art and Humanities. It's uh, a permanent sculpture, so it's in front of the Capitol View Library. 
And uh, the, this one was an interesting um, connection, had a really interesting public engagement uh, components because I designed the sculpture in a way that the public could decide uh, uh, what quotes uh, uh, from different authors we could uh, engrave, we could uh, cut on the, on, the, um, on the wings. And so we had um, a presentation of the sculpture and through the, the DC library practically facilitated the, um, uh, the process. So a lot of people sent uh, uh, quotes from books uh, or personal mm -hmm. quotes, and uh, they selected four. I think that there was uh, uh, Ellen Burroughs, uh, Barack Obama, Nelson Mandela, and Lockstone Hughes, I think. And so all these uh, writings were uh, engraved on uh, the wings. Ah, wow, that's wonderful. I, I thought that, that they might have been something by um, Frederick Douglass, who, of course, emphasized education and reading greatly. That's that, that's a, a perfect example of very site specific and community uh, uh, generated. So uh, let's move on to the next piece. Uh, I'm sound, fascinated sound by this one because sound, how does, where's the sound coming from? So this one is another interesting project is a permanent uh, sculpture that um, I created for uh, um, Greenway and Fort DuPont uh, Park. And so it's actually a triangular lot, triangular lot. Uh, and uh, when I went to see the first time the space, I mean, I was overwhelmed by the traffic and the, 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 there are practically three streets that are enclosing this uh, space. And so the main street is actually really, there, are, there is a lot of traffic, a lot of cars that are speeding. And so I was almost overwhelmed by the by the the, the noise. And so uh, right away I had this intuition that I had to create a, a sort of um, I want to work with the music in order to fight the the noise, uh, but in a visual way, right? And so uh, the first idea was to create a, a physical barrier uh, to help also the kids to feel safe when they were playing uh, inside the playground that we created. I work here with playground uh, uh, designer, uh, Justin Wilson, uh, for, the, for the design of the, the playground. And practically, uh, I extrapolated the sound wave from uh, take the A train from uh, Duke Ellington, and ah. so we we created I created this um, graphic representation of the music, but uh, also uh, I wanted to have this uh, huge sculpture is uh, probably twelve feet tall. The main the main sculpture is twelve feet tall, and I wanted also to uh, help uh, the parents of the kids uh, that are you know waiting for the kids to play. Uh, to give them some seating. Uh, and so uh, I wanted this transition between this initial sculpture that is a sound wave to a seating system that uh, give the option to sit in different ways. And, and after this, uh, this sort of sculptural bench uh, become a dry river and that uh, move to the, to the playground where there are uh, three or four different games. And so the fabrication was actually really, really complex. Uh, Doesn't the next can... slide show you yeah. the reclining yeah. <laughs> on the sculpture? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I was this... actually testing, <laughs> testing <laughs> how comfortable <laughs> was, was the, the bench. Uh, practically, uh, I had to manually bend uh, each uh, flat bars, and I had to create uh, uh, several sections and bend manually the flat bar and weld the flat bars uh, from the back, uh, shape it, uh, uh, was a very complex uh, operation. So I spent uh, only for the um, uh, seating system, I spent two weeks, uh, uh, I had to uh, rent a practically a space uh, where they, 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 they gave me, you know, uh, you know, be crazy. Did you select the color scheme for the final? Yes. Uh, and yeah. did you do the painting yourself? Yeah, the painting we had to do powder coating uh, in order to uh, have a, a more solid uh, uh, painting. So I had to have a, a professional painter 
uh, do the powder coating uh, for it in order to. Uh, yeah, we have. When you do public sculptures, there there are a lot of requirements in terms of safety and maintenance. Yes. And so, for example, in the previous uh, sculpture, uh, Freedom to Read. Uh, uh, you know, even the letters and the openings, they cannot be too small uh, because the kids, you know, can put their yeah. fingers and cut themselves. They cannot be too big because they can use them as a ladder. Uh, you cannot create spaces where, you know, uh, leaves and dirt can collect. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, uh, indication that they give normally. And one of it is uh, maintenance, right? So sure. it has to be easy to maintain. And uh, does your architectural training and work experience help you address those more easily? Those issues, yeah. Uh, my experience as an architect, uh, in order to deal with uh, uh, the permitting process, was uh, really important. I mean, if you think about uh, for this project, uh, I actually counted uh, only the emails that uh, I exchanged with the Commission of Arte Humanities, I think that there were more than 400 just with them. And that's what uh, I was in, telling you. I was that <laughs> I'm the kind of person that you'd be trading those emails with. Right? <laughs> you worked in Annapolis. Uh, but anyway, that's a great shot, though, of you both at work. Mm -hmm. That is you welding, right? And then mm -hmm. you yes, yes. Uh, yeah. OK, that's that's a very <laughs> uh, another uh, there. That's the image that I think is especially appealing because of the way it flows into the yeah. paint on the on the uh, concrete. That's yeah. Yeah, and also the coordination, you know, for because we had I had to take care of everything. So concrete pouring, uh, yeah. had to coordinate with the um, concrete company to to pour the concrete. We had to do I had to do the painting. Uh, I actually involve uh, students from UDC. From uh, I I teach at the uh, University of District of Columbia, and uh, I involved uh, uh, some students to work with me on the painting of the pattern so i i wanted uh, i always try to create these teaching yes. uh, moments uh, in in my work Good. That, that's wonderful um i think we have another large scale piece but again now marissa is helping to keep me on uh, more aware of the time um is there something you could say quickly about this? Because I want to do, I do want to get on to your smaller. Yeah, pieces. this this one was uh, another another sculpture with the same uh, um, idea of the curved shapes, but the, I use also uh, colored glass uh, elements, and so the the idea was to create this beginning and end of the rainbow in the same point, or so. So I have the rainbow that is coming <laughs> yes. in the same. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's lovely in a natural setting with all of the greenery and the uh, foliage. Uh, it's a wonderful. Let, but let's. I do want to get onto some of the smaller ones because I think they're beautiful. And I'm a little curious. Um, do you mind if we move ahead of this? Yeah, one? yeah sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is just such a complex and dynamic form. I uh, I'm not quite sure that. I conceptualize in my mind only seeing a two-dimensional image. What's happening here? So yeah. So uh, uh, for for years, I work on a series of sculptures that I call minimal surfaces, and uh, you know, minimal surfaces in mathematics is the surface surface that uh, uh, locally minimize uh, its area. So if you think about a bubble, a water bubble, a soap bubble, uh, is a minimal surface because you have certain constraints that uh, is the uh, uh, limit that limit the bubbles and create the shapes. Yes, and so I, I work for years on. Um, I was really really interested in also the mathematical equations that uh, are related to it, and I I studied especially the shark surface. Um, but practically, when I was doing my MFA, uh, I was uh, uh, we had a foundry, a uh, bronze foundry over there, so I had access to. Um, both uh, a ceramic shell and investment uh, um, uh, technique for for in order to create sculpture in bronze and uh, aluminum. And so I at the beginning, I tried to create the shapes uh, in, you know, by using paper and wax uh, and, uh, you know, I was bending mm -hmm. them, cutting them. 
but I realized that you know it was much easier to work uh, with um, 3D modeling and uh, my background in architecture and 3D modeling had a lot. So I was actually, I started working with mathematical software and export, export the model and work with the 3D model, 3D print it. Uh, and um, we, this one, you know, uh, back in 2000, uh, I think 2016, 17. So I think that uh, 3D printing became really affordable uh, right after I started working with it. And so at that time I started testing thermoplastic materials. So the PLA and ABS that you use for 3D printing. And I was, uh, instead of working with wax or actually I was working both with wax and the 3D printed parts in order to create the sculptures. And, and after I was just using the positive model to cast it in metal. Oh, and so okay. I was able to create these really interesting shapes. Yeah, so this is this is not 3D printed, but you used the 3D yeah. uh, printer to yeah. make the, the beginning of the, uh, um, the Mac. Yeah. yeah, practically this one is part of it is 3D printed, part of it is model with wax. Uh, uh, at the beginning, I was trying to find uh, a good compromise between uh, uh, manual work uh, and uh, and also uh, digital work. But the, the, if you uh, uh, if you look at the other sculpture, the one after this, I think that the, this one Let's is. Let's jump in a second, yeah. but I have one last Marissa yeah. back just for one second. Did you uh, apply the patina yourself? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, you know, hot patina uh, on bronze. Normally, yeah. I really like, you know, a, um, a basic uh, uh, dark uh, patina at the beginning with yes. um, liver sulfur. And after, you know, uh, I work actually, uh, I always try to use this natural uh, effects. So I really like, for example, the color of the rust. Uh, the color of the you know copper when is uh, uh, yes, the green the, and the, the surface blue. looks very organic uh, yeah. in in its coloration as well as in its uh, flowing form. So yeah. I just wanted to uh, know if you were responsible personally. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah So I also, know. <laughs> you know, if you think about you know you uh, with a natural patina uh, is uh, is interesting to created this connection between the uh, traditional sculpture in bronze yeah. and, you know, with a completely uh, innovative shape. Yeah. Okay, next slide. And, and this one uh, is actually, this one is actually uh, uh, completely 3D printed. And so I found, uh, you know, the main limitation at the, at the beginning, at least the main limitation of 3D printing was the size, right? So uh, I was working with small 3D printers. And so I started looking for uh, uh, technologies that could uh, help me to create uh, bigger pieces. And I found uh, uh, a foundry in Baltimore, actually, Danco Arlington, and another company in um, uh, Freshmade, uh, that they were able to uh, 3D print with these, uh, you know, $2 million 3D printers in sand, in silica sand. Normally, foundry use additive manufacturing to create the negative for the for the for the models, but uh, I started testing an infiltration system with uh, epoxy resin in order to improve what we call uh, the green state uh, printed parts. And so this one is actually sand, is a silica sand that is three uh, D printed with a furan binder, and oh. uh, I infiltrated it with. Uh, there, there, are, there is a process of infiltration uh, with epoxy resin, and uh, I, uh, because I, I wanted to create this metallic effect. Uh, effect uh, I use uh, uh, practically uh, aluminum powder mixed with uh, the, the epoxy resin, and I gave this uh, interesting patina. So, like just patina. for clarification. The 3D printer is ejecting a material that is composed of all of those different materials you just mentioned. It's not. Yeah, there, there are there are you know uh, different 
technology. So the one that I uh, use over here is called binding jetting. And so the printer is actually uh, releasing some uh, uh, binders, so practically some glue, and uh, through a pattern. And so and there is a, a roller that is actually moving the, the metal, can be metal powder or can be sand powder. And so the machine is actually gluing layer by layer oh, okay. uh, the sections and is building up the model. But it's very fragile, so when when is you know it's it's not really uh, sturdy. So I had to find uh, a way. And so we did a lot of testing also through the university, uh, mechanical testing to see how strong it is, and it's actually strong like concrete. Uh, well, I'm so. glad I asked the question then because I envisioned this uh, partly because of the sand material and the uh, gray color. Uh, I think we've all seen. Um, uh, uh, videos promoting the idea that you can build a house out of oh, yeah. 3D printed <laughs> cement. Uh, yes, and, yes. and so what you're doing here is more complex and certainly more beautiful. <laughs> and, and yeah, there are, there are, I mean, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on using the same technologies that are using right now with extru uh, cement extrusion uh -huh. uh, that they normally use to print houses. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, you know, I have some ideas. I already, con I already have contacts with a couple of companies in order to uh, print scale. out in concrete. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wonderful. Well, the next piece is very similar to this, isn't it? But a different yes. material. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, uh, I wanted to to show you the difference between uh, uh, a similar model, but in a completely different material. Yes. So, so let's um, look at that, Marissa. Yeah, the, that one is um, practically a almost transparent 3D printed resin that we we use uh, stereolithography SLA to to print the model and um, and so there is a, a lot of uh, post processing that we need that I need to do you know cleaning and yes, yes. Uh, adjusting but it's the layers doing. it's printed out in layers like the yes yes mm -hmm. yes but with a different material well yeah. uh, and it, as is it translucent? It appears to be translucent. Yes, yes. It's almost transparent, yeah. Ah, that's That must be beautiful uh, in dramatic sunlight, just as in this uh, mm -hmm. studio photograph. Yes, yes. It's beautiful as well. Well, we are running close to our um, conclusion. So, uh, Marissa, how many images do we have left? I want to say we have about two, I think, three images. Okay, let's let's move pretty quickly so that we see them all because I do, yeah. <laughs> that day. Yeah, this one this one is last uh, last uh, series of work that I'm doing with the uh, lattice structures, and uh, so practically I'm connecting to I'm connecting historical sculptures yes. to these new technologies. So I'm using um, Roman, especially in Roman and Greek sculptures. Uh, and I try to fill the volume with uh, lattice structures that are these um, uh, cellular uh, materials. So practically, uh, you can have you know beans, surfaces, or plates yeah. uh, that yeah. created these stochastic patterns. And so it's really interesting to uh, find this balance between the internal and external uh, surface of the sculpture, uh, you know, and see this interaction. Uh, uh, it is. It's, it's fascinating and beautiful and what a, a wonderfully creative and original idea. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, you know, again, being an art historian and seeing even before I saw the title, it's oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, that that's like a <laughs> some kind of strange classical sculpture. So uh, again, a wonderful idea. Uh, next uh, image. Now, this is the one where I cannot imagine how you how the printer constructed it. Uh, but I know you're going to tell us that. Uh, yeah, this, this one is actually binding jetting with plaster. And so uh, there is a lot of work uh, that needs to be done uh, uh, digitally in order to prepare uh, the model for printing because, you know, there is a, there are limitations in terms of thicknesses and, uh, you know, how strong can be the sculpture. So there is a lot of testing, you know, uh, behind the, the, the scenes. But uh, this one is actually plaster that is printed through a layer by layer. 
uh, through <laughs> binding jetting and uh, is uh, even this one is infiltrated with with epoxy resin. You can use uh, it's fun because I tested so many uh, different metals. I use you know water and salt. I use uh, channel acrylate glue, you know super glue to to try to reinforce the structures. So it's a really interesting uh, not only an aesthetic research but also a technical uh quest that i have in order to find you know uh, uh new materials i have two questions one i think yes. is very simple and the other i'm not even sure i can ask the question clearly but the the easy one is do you have to do a lot of uh hand finishing polishing sanding filing etc yes yes yeah, yeah. so the, the what we call post-processing of the yeah. 3d printed part uh, um for these uh, uh, is actually quite uh, simple because uh, practically the plaster powder is actually supporting uh, the printed uh, the printed powder. So uh, when you have the printer that release the model, you can vacuum and clean up uh, with a brush uh, and um, with um, air compressed compressed air. You uh -huh. can clean up all the parts. But uh, there is a lot of work in order to infiltrate uh, the, the parts and make it stronger. And so, and uh, this one is actually on a alabaster base that I made. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, there is a lot of work, uh, like in photography, right? Yes. So yeah. if you think, if you think photography, there is a, a lot of work that you do before, but also uh, a lot of work that you do after in order to find the right uh, uh, contrast. And, <laughs> Well, that, that's an interesting parallel that you bring up because my question, I'm not sure I can articulate well, is mm. you're using a computer technology to, to produce these. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to write code to get it to produce these physical objects. Who's writing yeah. that code? Yeah, no, uh, practically... Uh, is uh, is interesting because uh, uh, normally what we call uh, um, likely modeling, uh, uh -huh. digital modeling is actually done manually. So we have software that we can use to, uh, and we can use, you know, uh, a tablet or you can use a monitor with a touch, touch sensor uh, monitor. Uh, okay. And you can use the pen as a brush but in 3D. And so it's like a Photoshop in 3D yes. where you can uh, uh, move the, the, the masses, you can increase or reduce the shape, so you can you know, change uh, the, and okay, it's so done the, manually, yeah. The but, software but, is so powerful that you simply work as a, a modeler or a, a draftsman. Yeah. Uh, well, that's great to know because yeah. I could not imagine that one person could write the code for something like this and then create all the other things that you're creating. I, I would have said, I'm glad to meet uh, Leonardo's descent. <laughs> now there is a, is a uh, automatic in terms of the translation between the model and the mesh model, the, the SDL yeah. file, and the translation to the 3D printer is normally automatic. You can just you know send the, the model through uh, a slicer software that cut the model in slices and send to the printer. But it's yeah, it's not it's not uh, it's not always easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. well, I did see a question pop up in the chat. Uh, a very good question. Uh, do are we at our last image, Marissa? Uh, let's see. Yes, that was the last image. Okay, uh, and when my watch is almost six o'clock, so let's do take that uh, two questions I see in the chat, and then maybe we have time for one or two more from the other participants. Um, okay, it looks like um, it was the same question from the same person. I apologize, I can't pronounce your first name. It's Shahrazad. Shahrazad, yes. okay. okay. Well, Thank then, you. I, please ask your question yes, live. Yes, feel free. Okay, so so you know I know Davide for a very long time, and and he does these multidisciplinary projects, and they are very difficult to handle from the environmental aspects to the public rules aspect to to you know his own creativity, and I just would like to know how he 
handles that because it's very difficult. He and I are both professors and, and it's a difficult uh, task. So I just like, like to get his own view on how he handles that. Uh, I don't sleep a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I drink a lot of Italian coffee, espresso. <laughs> uh, recently, I had to cut it because it was too. But no, I mean, is a. Uh, um, I I feel natural. This uh, also this connection between teaching. Uh, I always uh, feel really rewarding uh, sharing with the students. Uh, my work uh, is, you know, and. Uh, uh, teaching is helping me also to focus more on um, how to communicate in better way with both my art and uh, uh, because you know when you when you need to teach something uh, you need to find the simpler way to um, explain you know the process and uh, and prepare the students so uh, I, I I think that the my teaching work at the university uh, at UDC is helping also to concentrate more, is also pushing me to uh, test new technologies. So um, for the students, you know, I don't want to limit their experience to just uh, uh, 3D printing, traditional sculpture. So uh, I want to explore virtual reality, augmented reality, projection mapping. And so I always find myself in researching uh, new things. And when I start you know, uh, when I look how or what new technologies can do, and uh, I, I always have new ideas that I want to pursue. That is why I have some projects that um, I started, you know, more than 10 years ago, and uh, I haven't finished them yet. <laughs> uh, well, Davide, it's been wonderful talking to you. Your work is uh, very impressive, very beautiful, very fascinating, and it's uh, complexity, both formally and, and physically and conceptually, but we have run out of time and I never got to ask you about your American flag project, but I do have one final question mm -hmm. before we close. Uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, Italian coffee. Coffee is that Cafe Corretto by any chance? <laughs> Cafe Corretto is actually uh, when you add uh, to the uh, coffee some grappa. Um, or you can add, you know, some alcohol, some some grappa. And uh, in Treviso, uh, you know, uh, uh, is actually normal to have it in the morning. Too. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, I'm no longer it. able to drink, but that's one of the things I missed most of all uh, for not being <laughs> able to drink alcohol. Well, anyway, uh, again, uh, that day, thank you. I hope that we'll meet and uh, have other opportunities to talk. And Marissa, thank you for your excellent support as usual. And thanks to all of you who listened in. And remember, uh, in about two weeks, we'll have this edited. We'll have it on the uh, MFA website. Uh, and of course, David A will be able to do whatever he wishes with it uh, himself. You can share so, it. <laughs> thank you thank all. Thank you so much, Will. And thank you, Marisa. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.